Hello teacher, welcome. In this video, we are going to talk about our first topic for PED 3, facilitating learner-centered teaching. And with that, I welcome you to this discussion. So first, let us have this introduction to learner-centered teaching. In the last 20 years of research in the field of learner-centered teaching, the evidence points strongly to bringing the students at the center or the focus of the learning process. With that being said, I believe that we can relate to this um, idea since uh, most of us here have somehow experienced before wherein our teachers stay in front of our classroom and they just keep on talking and while we students just stay in our seats. However, I also believe that most of you have experienced those different activities given to you by your teachers. You were allowed to do some tasks such as role playing, you were allowed to do some reporting in front of the classroom and you were allowed to um, brainstorm with your classmates and those activities are just examples of a learner-centered teaching and now let's proceed to the core idea of learner-centered teaching so what is learner-centered teaching all about Okay, so we have here a graphic organizer or somehow a concept map wherein um, it shows the five features or the five key changes in learner-centered teaching practices. And this was proposed by Marilyn Weimer. And Weimer attempted to comprehensively discuss what are those key changes that we can observe from the traditional to the learner-centered teaching. And so we have here the balance of power. Next is the evaluation purpose and process, followed by the role of teacher. Of course, there is really a big difference between the traditional and the um, learner-centered teaching for this matter, for the role of teacher. Next is for the function of content. And lastly is for the responsibility of learner, since we are now on the learner-centered teaching. Now let us talk about the first key change, which is the balance of power. So in this slide, we can see here the direct comparison for the balance of power from the traditional classroom and the learner-centered classroom. If you can see here in the slide, we have here some underlined words and phrases. And so for the traditional classroom, please take note that when we talk about the balance of power, the power for the traditional classroom belongs to the teacher. Would you agree with me that the power just belongs to the teacher? The students just have to listen to what is the teacher um, talks about in front in the classroom. While on the learner-centered classroom, the power now is being shared by the teacher with the students. So in the learner-centered classroom, the teacher shares that power by consulting learners prior to making final decisions. Let's say, for example, the teacher will ask the students of what are the activities that they would like to do or who are the group mates that they want to have in their group or this, the setting of deadlines, okay? The, the, the students could still have the power for that. And also the pacing of learning. That is why during the flexible learning modality that we have observed in the past two years when pandemic happened, we can really say that we have observed or we have met the standards for this student-centered teaching because you were given the chance to do or to decide your own pace of learning. Next, for the learner-centered classroom, when we talk about function of content, teachers need to allow learners to raise their own questions, generate their own answers or solutions. I do believe that you have also experienced this one. You were allowed by your teachers to ask questions. Let's say, for example, just by simply, um, like, you know, in a classroom setup, after the discussion, after the lecture, the teachers will ask the class, who among you here have questions so far? Or do you have questions so far? Or what difficulties do you have for this lesson? So with that, you are already allowed by your teachers to raise your own questions. So if I were you, 
you really have to grab that chance to clarify some difficulties about your lessons because that's how our classrooms work nowadays we are observing already the learner centered classroom we are giving you the chance to construct your own knowledge to develop your critical thinking skills so grab the opportunity when your teachers ask you what are your questions for that lesson again next is from a constructivist perspective knowledge cannot simply be given to students a constructivism so students must construct their own meanings okay sino yung mga constructivist theorists natin sina john piaget sina lev vygotsky so yun sila talaga yung kumbaga isa sa mga uh, proponents wherein na adhere itong learner centered classroom idea and also, for the function of content, teachers must begin by finding out students' prior knowledge. Our schema. It is very important. So, in the future, when you are already in the field, so, of course, we have to observe this learner-centered classroom. And we are advised or we are encouraged to begin by finding our students' prior knowledge. You have to do some pre-tests. So that you will have somehow a guide on um, what are the things that you have to still further discuss or do you have to move on to jump off to the next topic, something like that. So that is a um, learner-centered um, approach. And also, for the function of content, students master targeted skills and content before progressing to another lesson. This is what I'm talking about. And we can also relate to this the um, phrase by the De Department of Education wherein they say that no child shall be left behind. Before jumping off to another lesson, make sure that all of your students have understood your present lesson. Kasi para walang maiwan. Para, para kasi umabot ka na ng fourth grading, mayroon pang mga estudyante mo no, yung, la, yung level of knowledge pa lang nila as andun pa lang sa first grading. So, mahirap yon kapag mayroon ka pang mga estudyante na hindi mo napagtuunan ng pansin, hindi mo na-assess yung kanilang um, knowledge level. So, parang, di ba, spiral progression kasi. Um, same topic, however, nagiging broader yung knowledge na ibinibigay natin sa kanila. So, what if hindi naging strong yung basic foundation ng knowledge nila? So, parang mahihirapan sila. Then, the child will definitely be left behind. So, yeah. With this one, allowing our students to master the targeted skills, the com learning competency being stated in our curriculum guide, this will help our students and now let's talk about the role of teacher so what's the difference between the traditional classroom and the learner-centered classroom when it comes to the role of the teacher so of course in today's time for the learner-centered classroom teachers encourage students to explore multiple knowledge sources make sense of it, and personally organize the information taken from different sources. Kaya wag kayong magtaka if your teachers ask you to do some research, like organize your thoughts and ideas. Pinapagawa kayo ng outline based on the research that you had. Kasi, kumbaga, part talaga yan siya ng mga teaching learning activities in the learner-centered classroom. Kasi si teacher, yung goal niya is to involve students, involve you or your your goal in the future is to involve your students in the process of acquiring and retaining information. So, hindi lang si teacher yung source ng idea. So, hinahayaan si student na siya yung mag-research on his or her own. Also, the teachers must become comfortable with changing their leadership style from directive to consultative. Kasi sa traditional learning, uh, our teachers are like, you know, very authoritarian. Do as I say. Okay, do as I say. Ganito dapat. My, my classroom, my rule. So, that is the very traditional classroom. However, in the learner-centered classroom, the teacher will now change. He or she will now say, based on your needs, let's co-develop and implement a plan 
of action. So based on the needs, what do you need? What's your ano, what's your intelligence pala based on the multiple intelligences theory? What is your learning style pala? Diyan mag-a-adjust si teacher. Now, of course, hindi lang si teacher yung mag-a-adjust dapat. Si estudyante din, nag-adjust yung kanyang responsibility for learning. Kasi, since we they are already given a chance to you know to choose what lessons to learn, to choose what activities to do, what assessment tasks to do, to show their um um gain competency. So, dapat din lang na mas maging mataas yung sense of responsibility ni estudyante. In the recent years, work on self-regulated learning has advanced and the goal of 21st century education ought to be the creation of independent, autonomous learners who assume responsibility for their own learning. Maybe in this part of the lesson, we could somehow reflect and our performance as a student during the flexible learning modality that we had for the past year. Did we become independent? Are we really independent learners right now? Baka meron pa sa atin dito, nagre-rely lang sa ating mga teachers. Kung ano yung binibigay ni teachers na mga reading materials, yan lang din. So, anong pinagkaiba nun? Yung mode of, mode of learning lang, pinagkaiba lang nun is yung ano lang, yung um, platform na ginamit. Kasi ina-upload ni teacher sa Google Classroom yung mga lahat ng reading materials. nag apply si teacher ng, ano, nagpapa, nagpapanood si teacher sa inyo ng video sa YouTube. Something like that. However, did we somehow got to the point wherein we really took the initiative to search for other sources? Did we become independent and autonomous learners in some way? So, yun siya. Mag-reflect tayo. Kasi yun yung dapat eh. Yun yung dapat um, nagawin natin as learners of the 21st century education. That is how learner-centered classroom should be like when it comes to the responsibility for learning of the students. Learning skills of autonomous self-regulating learners can be learned and must be taught even at an early age. Take note, even at an early age. So, whether you are an elementary teacher or a high school teacher, since you are still in the basic education, you really have to adapt to this already, to the learner-centered classroom. It is already encouraged how much more that you are already in the tertiary education, right? So again, ha, you are future teachers, either elementary or high school teachers, and you should teach your students to become independent, autonomous, self-regulating learners. Kapag sinabing mag, hindi na kailangan dapat utusan na mag-study, dapat sila na mismo maging independent na, magkaroon na ng initiative to study, to research on their own, to help themselves. Okay? So that's just the point of it. So we have here a photo. I have seen, actually seen this in, on Facebook. So how to teach your child? Uh, what are the proper way of teaching your child? So it, not, it does not just apply apply on teaching your future children, mga knickknacks, but it will really also help you teach your students in the future. So, always teach your child or student self-discipline. Okay? The child should learn to discipline themselves and do the necessary things even if they aren't related to playing and fun. So, if you can see here in the picture, sino ba dito sa inyo yung nakatry na kailangan, kailangan pang samahan ni mama gumawa ng assignment? Ha, kahit na lang dumating na ng grade 6, si mama pa din yung nag mo si mama pa rin yung nagmumodule. Okay, so hindi po yan siya dapat. Now, let us talk about the next um, key change for the learner-centered classroom. So, we have here the evaluation purpose and process. So, the change 
is not only ob observable for the content, for the role of the teacher, for the role of the students, but we must also talk about the difference between the evaluation purpose and process between the traditional and the learner-centered classroom. So for the learner-centered classroom, sophisticated learners know when they do or do not understand some time to reflect. Do you yourself do some self-critiquing, self-reflection, self-assessment if whether you have understood or not the topic given to you on that day? Or like you just go with the flow, like you just do the tasks given to you by your teachers just to comply being given to you? If you are really a student of the 21st century education, you really know how to how to assess yourselves okay you should know when you have understood fully the lesson or not learners should be able to review a performance and you have you already know how to identify the things that you have to improve let's say for example in after your summative exams you have to reflect or to assess your performance did you get a high score or not if you got a high score what could be the factor that helped you in getting a high score or if you have got a low score what's the reason behind getting a low getting a low score so parang ganon you have to identify you have to review your performance your study skills and that matter for example for the summative assessment that we have been talking about those are the five key changes that have been observed for the learner-centered teaching or for the learner-centered classroom so first there is a change in the balance of power with the teacher balance of power of the teacher and the student next there is a change for the function of content there is also a change for the role of teacher a change for the responsibility for learning of the students and lastly there is a change when we talk about evaluation purpose and process now let's go to the four principles of student-centered approach what are those four principles but before that let's talk about this one there is a study conducted wherein Next survey said that so 12 public high schools in New England in terms of how they apply learner-centered teaching in their classroom practices. And the said survey summarized their findings in two, four tenets. So what are those four tenets or four principles? So they have discovered that teachers in New England apply, they apply this, con the, learn the concept of learning is personalized. Second, learning is competency-based. Third, learning happens anytime, anywhere, and students take ownership of their own learning. First is when we talk about learning is personalized, students engage in different ways and in different places. When we, diba, students have different interests, right? The teacher will base the activities on the interests of students. So let's say, for example, the students love to dance. So the student, or, or the teacher rather, will allow the student to do some dancing to showcase the things that he or she have learned for that lesson. If the student is into arts and crafts, so the teacher will allow the student to do some por portfolio. Through the portfolio, the student will able to showcase the knowledge that he or she have gained throughout the lesson once again. And next is for the learning is competency-based. Students move ahead when they have demonstrated mastery of content, not when they reach a certain birthday or endure the required hours in a classroom. Again, take note, learning is competency-based. I know you're already familiar with the curriculum guide, and in the curriculum guide, the learning competencies per grade level or per lesson is indicated there. The students 
will go to another um, learning competency, will learn another learning competency if they have mastered the content of the or the current lesson. It doesn't matter if you're already old, <laughs> if the student is already old, being in that grade level, being stuck up, being retained in that grade level, okay? Because what we are looking forward to this um, type of learner-centered approach, learning is competency-based, is that we are helping them to master the content. So next is learning happens anytime, anywhere. So some teachers in the New England observe classroom approach wherein they allow the learning of their students to take place beyond the traditional school day and even the school year. And learning is also not restricted to the classroom. They have field trips. Maybe they somehow give tasks to their students. Something like that. Napagbalik ng kanilang klase. So, what were, what did you do? What were your experiences? So, learning happens anytime, anywhere. And lastly, students take ownership of their learning. So, students are engaged in their own success as well as incorporate their interests and skills into the learning process. Kasi, mayroon ako nabasa na actually connected lang din siya sa learning is personalized. The more you allow your students to do tasks according to their own interests, so, pas magiging, mas magiging comfortable sila, they will take ownership of their own learning because they can relate to the task. They love what they are doing. That way, they will become proud of their outputs. And so, they will take ownership of their own learning. Now, we have here the top 20 principles for pre-K to 12 teaching and learning. So, what are those principles? So, first is the belief on personal intelligence. Lahat ng bata mayroong utak. Lahat ng tao mayroong utak. Depende na lang talaga kung paano siya tutulungan ng kanyang guru. Also, we believe that our students have prior knowledge. Meron talaga. Hindi yan sila tabula rasa. Hindi na yan sila tabula rasa. Mga empty tanks na kailangan yung ano. Meron na talaga yung mga prior knowledge. Because they have already experienced something. Even though 1 to 3 years old, may mga na-experience na yan. Nananay mga buot. Nasulod na na sa ilang mga otok. So, they already have prior knowledge. Next, students have their own creativity and mastery goals. And also we have to, for the teaching and learning uh, in today's time for the 21st century um, education, we have to apply contextual learning based on context. What happens in our environment in today's time? So we have to um, consider this. And also we have to consider the long-term knowledge. It, it's not enough for us to just um, give them short-term knowledge, but the things that they have to learn as they go through on their lives. And also, we have to consider the importance of giving feedback to our students. This is very important. Let's proceed to the other principles for pre-K to 12 teaching and learning. So we have here self-regulation. We have mentioned this already earlier that our students must be responsible enough, must be disciplined enough in terms of their own learning. Self-regulation. Next, they must have their own creativity. We must help them develop their creativity as their teachers. Next, it is very important for us teachers to develop their own intrinsic motivation because intrinsic motivation is way more better than extrinsic motivation. Now, next is for their mastery goals. Sabi nga doon, di ba? They have to master the learning competency first before proceeding to another level. Next is we have to um, allow them. As teachers, we have to allow them know what or our expectations. Why? What's the importance of allowing our students to know what are our expectations or allowing them to know that we are expecting a lot from them? It's because this will allow them to be encouraged to become responsible learners because you have set a standards. You expect them, you tell your students to expect them. Say, for example, you tell your students to 
Okay, I expect you to submit a portfolio that is well crafted, that is thick or like 100 pages thick. So, what will happen? Your students will try their best to manage their time, to do some research, to use all the resources that they have just to meet with your expectations. So, you are helping your students become responsible. Next, we have this so-called short-term goals. Okay, We have mentioned earlier that it's very important for us to allow our students to have their long-term goals. Now, how do we achieve those long-term goals? Of course, by starting with little things, by achieving short-term goals, okay? If we want our students to acknowledge that their goal is to become successful in life, to become a teacher, to become a doctor, so what's their short-term goal? It's to finish their grading periods to finish with honors in their specific grade level so short-term goals next principle is that learning is situated within multiple social contexts again contextual learning if we are in if we are assigned in far-flung areas, we have to adapt our examples. Our examples should be based on their own environment so that they can relate, right? Next is interpersonal relationships and communications are critical to both teaching, learning process, and the social emotional development of students. That is why it's very important for us to um, have or to maintain positive teacher relationship in our classroom. It's very important to allow them to feel that they belong in our class. It's for them to become active in our class to become socially and emotionally well-developed students. Next, let me just transfer my face. Next, emotional well-being influences educational performance, learning, and development. It is, um, this idea is highly connected to this idea, where in our classroom should be um, open for all we should have a positive relationship with our students and we should also encourage our students to have a positive peer relationship classmate relationship because once they are like emotionally stable in our classroom if they feel safe if they are feeling comfortable if they feel that they are being part of our of the family inside our classroom this will eventually have a positive impact on how they learn they will become more eager to learn. They will become more, they will become encouraged to participate more in the class discussion because they know that you as their teacher will listen to them, that you accept them for who they are. This will, uh, their emotion, emotional well-being will influence their educational performance, learning, and development. Next, expectations for classroom conduct for classroom conduct and social interaction are learned and can be taught using proven principles of behavior and effective classroom instruction. Again, expectation setting of high standards and expectation for our learners will help them become more motivated and more responsible learners. Next is effective classroom management is based on setting and communicating high expectations again and consistently nurturing positive relationships and providing a high level of student support if we can meet all of this three setting and communicating high expectations nurturing positive relationships and providing high level of student support well we can be now called as effective classroom managers effective and efficient teachers inside our classroom and next would be assessment what about assessment what's the principle for this assessment when it comes to the um, teaching and learning in the uh, K-12 to curriculum. So formative and summative assessments are both important and useful but require different approaches and interpretation. Teachers, please take note in the 21st century um, education, we no longer use 
the paper and pencil test alone. Yes, we, we can still use the paper and pencil type of assessment, but it's also important that we utilize authentic assessments, performance-based assessments. Mixed. It should be mixed. We should use varied assessment tasks. Okay, I hope that's clear. And the last two principles, student skills, knowledge, and abilities are best measured based at, with assessment processes grounded in psychological science with well-defined standards for quality and fairness. What's the purpose of those um, different proposed assessment tasks, mga different theories being proposed? Okay, they are made for us to utilize today. If meron tayong ano, if meron tayong assessment, hindi tayo basta-basta gumagamit ng assessment. Oh, sabi na, paper and pencil test lang palagi. O, ganun. Okay, we have to utilize various assessment because those uh, some of those assessments are actually based on studies, actually based on theories, studies na nagpo-prove that they are highly effective, okay, for our students. Next is making sense of assessment data depends on clear, appropriate, and fair interpretation. So after conducting our assessment, we gather the data. We gather their raw score, raw scores. Okay, who among our students got high score? Who among our students got low scores? In what specific part of the lesson do they score the least? Okay, so parang with that, this will eventually help us as teachers to realize na naging effective ba yung strategy ko na ginamit sa pagtuturo sa kanila or hindi. If it's not effective, I need to utilize another strategy. So, ganun yung idea dito. Making sense of assessment data. This, the data that we got is a sort of feedback for us teachers if whether we have utilized the correct strategies or not. That's it for this um, lesson. Hopefully, you have learned. You Hopefully, you have somehow gained additional idea on the different key changes in the 21st century teaching learning education as well as the four um, types of student-centered approaches and the top 20 principles for pre-K to 12 teaching and learning. So thank you so much for listening and see you on the next video. Bye!